I hope it was good. We were reviewing a food app as our last app in the app clinic, and I was so hungry <laughs> looking at this app. <sighs> All right, so this, this talk will be not very serious as a technical talk. It's mostly funny, it's full of illustrations. So if you're looking for something very intense technically, I won't look if you want to leave now. Uh, if you just want to have some fun after lunch, then you're in the right place. I will be talking about my tips for library development, and I am the startup developer in question. And this whole talk will be done in the style of XKCD, because I'm a big fan of Randall Monroe. And it's about the only thing I think I could draw. Um, so this will be the Android Makers edition of my talk. Uh, my name is Lisa Ray, and um, I have worked as an Android developer in a number of companies, from the New York Times to Google, and now for a startup probably no one's ever heard of, and which is not available currently in France, <laughs> called Present. Uh, we are a social network for women to connect in their local communities. Um, this is my Twitter handle. If you like my talk, feel free to tweet at me. If you don't like my talk, just keep it to yourself. But enough about me. We're here to talk about libraries. So I make libraries and I use libraries. And as a developer at my second startup in a row now, meaning I've been the sole developer of two Android apps in a row, I also have a lot of experience with libraries. And that's because I'm personally responsible for starting from file, new project in Android Studio, and picking out everything that goes into the final app that makes it into the Play Store. So as we all know, it starts out looking like this, and then pretty soon it looks like the Magna Carta. And that's because I also rely really heavily on libraries. At a larger company, you might have an internal library that does something, or you might prefer to get it just right by having an internal team build it to your specifications. Uh, but at a startup, I do not have that option. If there is any semi-reasonable solution out there, you know, an autofiller or an image cropper or a photo zoomer, I better just use it uh, because my time is precious. Uh, so I spend a lot of time searching out, vetting, and choosing open source libraries and sometimes suffering with them. Yet, it's one thing to use a library and it's another thing to write a library. And to be totally honest with you, um, in the beginning, I have a lot of demands on my time. I'm a bit of a selfish person. Um, if I'm going to spend my free time doing something, it's probably not going to be more work. Um, so when I was first op introduced to open source, my honest first reaction was, why do this thing for free on the internet? It's really easy to understand the value of community and free open source software, that it's something I can use. But I couldn't see how participating could benefit me. Even if I had to write something myself for my own work, to go through the trouble of writing licenses and readmes and to open source it seemed like extra work for no benefit. But after thinking about it for a long time, I really believe that writing a library is a task that benefits both you and the community. So here's how I envision your self-interest. And then since you are already a part of the Android community, whatever is in your self-interest is also by definition in the realm of community interest. And I made that self-interest bubble so big because you are almost certainly not the only person with your particular development problem. This is a place where it's a good thing that you are not a unique or special snowflake. So if you name the weirdest Android problem you've had, I bet five other people just in this room have also had it. So in this way, it's very good to share. So back to that library we're writing. We've established that you're probably not alone, but what about writing that library for other people is in your self-interest? Well, I still think that making a library is a bit like joining a startup. Uh, it will probably not make you rich, unfortunately. It will probably not get you famous, 
But it has surprising payoffs. Uh, it can't grant you equity, but you will find that it has other benefits. The first one, and I think the most obvious one, is that it can help you create modularity. We all know that modularity is an important part of software design, especially at scale. Well, it doesn't get much more modular than pulling parts of your app out into an externally published Maven dependency. That's a pretty hard line. And if it's hard to extract parts of your project, that probably means you needed to do it really badly. Modularity is also a really good reason to make parts of your project into a library to start, because you can enforce these boundaries from the very beginning. You can get community help by building a library. And in case that sounds kind of hippie for you, I'll translate. Other people are writing code for you for free. So I have an example for you. I had the opportunity last summer to work at the New York Times with my old team as a contractor. And since I was over the summer and they had actual interns, like young people, it was kind of fun. I was like the really old intern. No, not an experience you usually get to have. And I learned a lot over that summer. One of the things I saw was that their server team wanted to start using GraphQL. They wanted to be able to provide more efficient, personalized queries to the client apps. Now, whenever someone from the server team tells me, I'd like to make things easier for you on the app, I just jump for joy. But Facebook didn't provide an Android client. So the New York Times, Shopify, and several other companies all collaborated on an open source project to make an entire new client library. Uh, they're actually using it in production right now. Uh, that library is called Apollo GraphQL for Android, and it would never have happened without collaboration. The team that was working on the New York Times was quite small, just two or three of us. These are some extremely realistic likenesses of my coworkers from the summer based on their GitHub profiles. I hope they don't mind. Another reason to write a library is necessity. I simply need this library, and no one else has written it yet. Or I need this library, but none of the alternatives are acceptable to me. Maybe they use a license that my company can't accept. Maybe they have security issues. Maybe they're too big, or their API is too complicated. They're too big, too buggy, whatever. Or maybe you want to learn something new. Kotlin, animations, RxJava, whatever you haven't tried yet. A library can be a really good place to sort of sandbox your learning. Because as we all know, learning can be messy. And sometimes, especially in a larger team, you don't want to get your learning all over your existing code base. So a library can be a really good place to encapsulate that. So you've decided you want to make a library. What should you do? In this case, the question is, what problem should I try to solve? So I've selected a sample of differently sized problems that other people and other organizations have chosen to tackle with their own open source projects. And the first one is Android. Why not? It's open source. So if you are Google and you employ 60,000 60, sounds low, but many, many, many thousands of people, you can make an operating system. And it's a pretty good one. Nice job. Thank you, Google. If you're Facebook and you have 17,000 people, you can try and replace parts of Google's operating system. JetBrains, 700 people. You can write a new language. Square has 600 people, and they've produced the most popular networking libraries for Android, as well as a lot of others. And then this is you. In case you couldn't see that, this is you. You are a tiny, tiny dot in the void of emptiness. So. For your library, you should probably pick something really, really small to start with. And in case you're still worried that picking a project too small will make your library unimpressive and no one will use it, I'd like to talk briefly about something called Parkinson's Law. You may have heard people throw into conversation that work expands to fill all available time. 
Well, this was actually coined in 1955 in a comedy essay by this guy, Cyril Parkinson, in The Economist. And what he t actually talked about in this essay was he measured the bureaucrats of the British Empire at various stages, and he came up with this formula showing that uh, basically there will be inevitable growth of any organization. But the takeaway we seem to have taken in this day and age um, is that, as you can see, this formula is completely independent of the amount of work done. Uh, so no matter the size of any organization, it will always spend all of its time getting its work done. And this is still true for an organization of one. So likewise, your library will expand to become exactly as complicated as you could handle, no matter what topic you pick. So it's much better to start small. Otherwise, it will become too complicated, and then you'll disappoint your users. In the same vein, if you'd make a library, try to focus, at least at first, on a single use case. So the example here is that you should be able to state in one short sentence what your library does without using the word and. So additionally, a, a user should be able to use your library by copy-pasting two things from the top of your README. There should be a Gradle dependency import and a dead simple example. I really mean like one or two lines. This kind of thing here is exactly what you don't want to do. By the way, I should explain here, we're making American coffee. So we're going to pour water through, and it's going to drip. And then we'll get a large cup. That may clear things up. So you can see to set up the coffee maker, I have to pick one of the preset types of filter, and then one of the preset types of grind for the beans, and then I have to pick the water temperature. Nobody in America knows what temperature you brew coffee at. They just want to press the button. So this is overwhelming to someone who just wants a coffee, any coffee. So your library can provide deep customization options, but they should be a click away on a wiki page or at least further down the page on the readme. You should provide sensible defaults, make the library start with those, and then once your users got it set up, once they have it running, if they want customization, they'll go looking. They'll know where to find it. The one really good thing this library is doing is that it's using composition over inheritance. This would be an example of a library that's using inheritance. And you can probably see at a glance what the problem is. Because we're forcing the user to inherit from a base class, and of course, Java is single inheritance, our coffee maker can be either coarse grind or slow drip but not both. Um, this seems like an incredibly elementary example, but you wouldn't believe how many libraries are still like, use my cool adapter <laughs> and just extend it. I'm even guilty of this. So don't do this if you can at all possibly avoid it. And going back to the composition example, even better than presets is delegation. So in this case, instead of you having to anticipate and build all the needs of your users, which is literally impossible, you can allow them to customize in whatever way they choose. You can just provide an interface for each option, which they can implement, and then you pre-supply the library with your sensible default. And an example that's done this really well and I think has inspired a lot of other libraries is Retrofit. Feature requests. So if you have any success with your library, and if you thought about it carefully, you probably will, you will start getting feature requests. For example, this issue where the user says, add pasta cooking capability to the coffee maker. I'm using this library to make spaghetti. OK. So there's nothing wrong with using a library for something other than what it was designed for. Sometimes this is what makes us great as developers. We can think creatively and out of the box. Um, so there's a couple ways you can handle a really off-the-wall feature request like this. It's fine to say, you're welcome to send me a pull request, but this isn't a need of ours. So that's one option. That way, you don't get stuck implementing a laundry list of features from other people that don't help you, the number one. You can also just say no. 
people are never going to stop asking you for things. Bug fixes, feature requests, maintenance, support, new support library updates. Um, but you, you can say no if you don't want to do it, as long as you say it nicely. In fact, you may be using, doing all the other users of your library a favor because none of them want to make spaghetti. You're keeping your library focused. You're keeping it simple, and that's good. That's a good thing. This request does not serve the core purpose of the library. But you could also ask yourself if your library is flexible enough. So if we let Julie bring her, provide her own heater to the coffee maker, then you don't have to support or even think about what she is doing in there. So that's also an option. You should also be your own user of the library. If possible, you should be your own best user of the library. We've all heard the phrase, eat your own dog food, meaning use your own product. And the same goes for libraries. Um, if your own library isn't good enough for you, then who is it good for? It's just a resume project, you know? It's just padding your GitHub. And I also argue that you should fulfill your, company, your own needs or your own company's needs first. Why is this? For, for one, you are going to be your library's own most dedicated tester. Someone else may find a bug and say, screw this, I won't use it anymore. You're stuck. So <laughs> you want to be in the position of truly experiencing it. And having a real life need instead of an abstract idea for what a library should maybe do if you were to use it can help you keep it focused and simple. Honesty. This is a concept that's not talked about a lot in open source, but I think is important to think about. First of all, you should be honest about what your library does. I don't think people go on with the intention to lie, uh, but you see a lot of this stuff, which, which is bragging, when you read some library descriptions. But this kind of stuff doesn't really tell us anything about the library. It says a lot more about the library's author. So you want to be honest about your library's size and its scope. So it's fine to have fun with your description, uh, but you know, keep it real. We're, we're aiming for clarity here, not salesmanship. And you also want to be honest about your library's stability and maturity. And the best way to communicate that is through semantic versioning. I do know some people just generally think the number went up, must be a new release. Well, that's not wrong, uh, but if you're choosing the version number yourself, then you should know what it means. Uh, in very simple terms, the small number means a patch, a bug fix. Uh, the middle number usually means you've added new features. And the last one usually means breaking changes. It's a major version. So there's lots of great info out there on semantic versioning, so I'm not going to bore you with it. Um, but that's the 30-second overview. The one thing to know is about pre-release versions, like alphas and betas. Um, first of all, it's perfectly OK to release your library as an alpha. It's a really great way to get feedback, uh, and it's a great way to get other people to help you to finish it. But you have to make sure that you say it's an alpha somewhere obvious. Otherwise, people may use it in production. Well, people may use it in production on purpose. But if they use it in production by accident, they'll get really mad at you if it breaks. Um, so a version number followed by an alpha or beta means it's before that version number. I like to think of alpha versions as getting ready for version 2.5. And it's important to get that right, because otherwise, your users won't get those automatic update prompts in Android Studio, and they'll never make it to your real production version. And the question of honesty versus salesmanship is true on all other sites on the internet, too, not just your own GitHub. So I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but sometimes when you make a library, you just get so excited you can't help yourself. So if someone is asking questions related to your area of expertise on Stack Overflow, please do not just advertise your library. It's super annoying, we've all seen it, and everyone hates it until it's their own library. So what a user wants is for you to explain how making coffee works. If you truly can't help yourself, then just mention it at the end after you explain it. And by the way, I made a library. You should use it. That way they can ignore it. 
If somebody really wants to use a library in the end, they do this, they just go to this site called Google, and they search for a library that does that thing. And it turns out Google's pretty good at doing this, so it works out. Testing. Testing is always a bit of a sore subject. So the first time you get a pull request, you may be incredibly excited. I know I was. And then you think, how do I know if this works or not? So you're going to have to pull down this contributor's changes, probably test them in your example app, assuming you have even written one. You have to try first and verify the problem they reported. Maybe you don't even know how to reproduce it. Then you have to try and verify that they fixed it. It's going to take a long time. I know because I started out doing this manually, and I started to dread getting pull requests, which is the complete opposite of how you should feel. Except now, I'm really excited to get them, because I have a robust test suite, and it's running on a continuous integration server, like CircleCI, or Bitrise, or Travis, or any number of ones like this that offer free accounts for open source, free, uh, and they require little to no customization to get it set up for a simple Android project. So they will run your test suite of tests on every pull request, and they will put this beautiful, nice, big, green check mark next to it. It goes a really long way toward giving you peace of mind. Not to mention, tests are, of course, a really good thing to have anyway, but I'm not here to tell you how to live your life. They're just really good for collaboration. Another thing I don't feel gets discussed a lot when starting is ownership. So even though a library is open source, so it can still belong to someone, to you, to your company, to someone else's company. So if you work at a big company, like Google or Facebook, this question probably starts before you even start at the company. When you sign an employment agreement, you are probably agreeing that anything you make at the company will belong to the company, and that includes all the open source that you write. So there's a couple options here. You can release your own personal open source projects, and the company will technically own them. Now, if your library is free and open source, that may not be a problem because you weren't going to make money on it anyway. And the community can use it, and everything's OK. Uh, there might also be a process through which you can apply for an exemption. So like, if your library doesn't have commercial value for that company, uh, if it doesn't invent something new, if you're just clearly having fun and it's, it's a fun side project, they might give you the copyright back. I don't know why it really matters, but just for kicks. Um, the, the other big option, which might be the reason to join the company in the first place, is that you can work on their own open source projects. You can join Facebook and work on React Native or Litho. You can join Google and you can work on Android. That's pretty cool. So that's a huge perk of working at one of these big companies, even if there are complications. If you're working at a medium-sized company, I would recommend to just read your agreement. A lot of people don't. It probably, it could include boilerplate language like this, saying that they will own everything you write, uh, but you can almost certainly negotiate it, or at least split the difference. It might not have any of this language in it at all. They may not care what you do in your free time, uh, but that's why you have to read the document and not just sign on the dotted line. I have a job! If you work at a startup, on the other hand, you should still make sure it's OK. But they probably don't care what you do, as long as you are still keeping up in your main job. The real problem you're going to have is that you probably won't have time to do anything at all except your startup job. And finally, we'll talk about competition. So you've considered your ed cases. You've written tests. You've approached your open sourcing with honesty and integrity, and now you're basking in the attention of like a thousand whole people on the internet. Well, some other company made a library that does the same thing. They even drew an icon by a professional designer. It uses annotation processing or whatever's cool this week. Uh, it's even made by that same startup with the Polygon logo that makes all those other cool libraries that are popular in Android. Now no one is going to use your library. 
Well, it doesn't mean you did it wrong. It doesn't even mean that no one will use your library. Sometimes great libraries do seem to have a monopoly in the community. An example being something like Retrofit. But that isn't always the case. Uh, sometimes there are many really, really well-done alternatives that are also quite popular. For example, Glide, Picasso, and Fresco. So at one point, the outward APIs of Picasso and Glide were so similar that you could almost switch the dependencies in your project by doing a structural find and replace. Um, why would anyone pick one over the other? And more importantly, why would the maintainers of these libraries bother to keep doing this duplicated work? Of course, the answer is that these libraries are not the same. They're actually different in various ways. They have different implementation details. Some have extra features. But more than that, nobody needs to win when there's enough community support for everyone. Every single Android app does image loading. So we can support a lot of image libraries. So even if there are many libraries dealing with a topic, if none of them speak to you, it's totally OK to consider attempting it yourself. But first, I would stress that you should ask yourself what is specifically wrong with the existing alternatives. And then if you think you can improve significantly on those problems, then consider making your own. And finally, deprecation comes for everyone at some point. Don't expect immortality from your library. So especially if you are backporting something that you feel is missing from the Android library. They may not get to it in the timeline you would like, but the odds are that eventually, especially if your library gets popular, there's going to be a first party alternative that's going to deprecate yours. So here, the smaller and the more focused your library was to start with, the less this is going to hurt. It means you successfully identified a need, you made a useful contribution to the community, you got a great experience, you learned a lot, you made connections. I know I'm sounding kind of hippie, but you had a great time. This library was worth it. So if there's anything that you take away from this talk, it's that a library, especially one for mobile phones, is one of the few places where the smaller the task you choose, the better your contribution can be. So it's a really great place to practice your craft in isolation, away from the craft of a real project. And so if you're thinking of getting started, I would encourage you to look inside your app and see if you have even one or two lines of boilerplate code that you repeat over and over, or uh, an extensions.java class, or a sorry, or an extensions.kt class, or utils.java class and see about publishing that as a library. It may seem to you as though your library is small and trivial, but we in the community thank you for keeping your libraries focused and simple. And finally, you're not alone. If you have a problem, I can guarantee you other people have that problem too and would love your solution. So that's all I have. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions about my drawings <laughs> or about open source in general, um, we have a bunch of time to take those. Hi, uh, thank you for a really nice talk. And uh, I was uh, wondering if you are still doing uh, library development. I know you started uh, iGenius and maybe er earlier too. I didn't follow all the Android libraries out there, but uh, uh, I, I was. Uh, I would like to know if, uh, in a startup environment, you can still really uh, do open source development that may not uh, already uh, always uh, benefit directly your company because you have to keep up with versioning, with uh, managing deprecation, and a lot of stuff that don't benefit directly your your projects. Yeah, it's it's very difficult, and I think if you leave a company where you were where that company was supporting you in developing a core part of their app as a library, and then you go to somewhere else where it's not used anymore. I have seen many of my favorite libraries die this way. I was lucky in that my, the work I started at Genius was my pet project, and I've been able to bring it into my new app. So I'm happy to say that although I don't 
do it quite as much as I'd like, I still do actively maintain um, the library. Um, but it is, uh, it is true that when you switch jobs, especially if your company was sponsoring it or if your company has ownership of that library, sometimes it's end, end days for the library. Uh, in this case, they actually gave me the ownership of the library, although they didn't have to, so. And so you continue to do open source development right now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Fine. Yep. I don't know. All right. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, feel free to talk to me later.